Hi, today I wanted to look at the body language of two historical figures, the theoretical physicist Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer, who have returned to our lives through the spectacle movie Oppenheimer. And this right at a time when the threat of nuclear war is highest in decades. While putting out a warning of nuclear war by a movie is a good thing, it also brings the fear back into our minds. One could say our collective mind, as millions in the Western world watch this movie. As the movie does not show the actual destruction in Japan just through Oppenheimer's imagination, you could say it does not create fear. But many of us looked at the old eerie crinkly videos of nuclear tests from the 1940s and 50s in strange grey yellowish colors. They almost seem unphysical demonic, made out of the stuff of nightmares. As so many people watch the movie and we are supposed to trust the screenwriters, producers and directors to have done thorough research on the topic and historic events, a movie like that also solidifies a story and narrative and actually writes history, at least how we, the public, are supposed to see it. And it can create fear by raising awareness, but at the same time, we see that politicians are not doing anything about the situation and further escalate in the Ukraine. This creates helplessness and ultimately fear. When big historic movies are put out, to me this is always a point in time when one is supposed to pay attention to look a bit closer and analyzing body language, involuntary, uncontrolled aspects of human behavior, but also filming, editing and narratives can be helpful. Note, when I speak about the subject area, it is admittedly very speculative as I have not done extensive research. Also, I am very familiar with science. With these body language videos, I follow more my subjective intuition, my gut feeling, and not necessarily the facts. As presented to us for the last decades in school and history books and documentaries. Of course, I do not know the truth and I am just providing some thoughts on certain narratives which some might find useful. Okay, let's get started. So first, let's look at Albert Einstein. If someone represents science, it's not Anthony Fauci. No, it would be Albert Einstein, the iconic figure with chaotic hair, cheekiness and insightful quotes. Even the name Einstein is telling. Einstein in German means one stone, which could stand for a unique stone or a gem. While he died in Princeton, New Jersey in 1955, we have surprisingly little, or basically no, video material of him lecturing on a blackboard and explaining science in an expert fashion, even so he was the most famous scientist without doubt. It followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are food, are but different manifestations of the same thing, a somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. Furthermore, the equation E is equal M C square. Okay, so that's, I think, very insightful. This very short clip. So noticeably, he just reads off um, the simple science statement. And at the end, when he puts out his famous formula E equal M C squared, he hesitates. He doesn't seem to know the formula. Even so, it must be his second nature. Imagine a professor at university reading of notes when actually discussing his or her own research. It would be unthinkable. When I see Albert Einstein or even walked by his former house in Princeton when I visited some years ago, I never got a feeling of authenticity. Surprisingly, after living in Princeton for 22 years, he is not a big deal there. There's only a small bust of him in downtown Princeton. E is equal m c square in which energy is put equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy and vice versa. The mass and energy were in fact equivalent according to the formula mentioned above. This was demonstrated by Kokra and Walton in 1932 experimentally. So at the end he looks up with a questioning look like, how was that? Okay, 
which I find unusual for an authoritative figure. So you also notice his sad eyes, the uh, corners of the eyes are pointing downward. Sadness means being pulled back, living in the past, which clouds rational thinking and scientific thought process. He had failed marriages. In fact, he married his first cousin. Note, there's a preserved blackboard in Oxford with his writing in chalk. But this looks staged as well, not like something which has grown organically while giving a lecture. It reminds me more of the blackboards you see sometimes in cafes where they put down the menu. New Jersey's most famous foreign-born citizen, Professor Albert Einstein, who helped discover the atom bomb. Here you don't actually see him writing anything on the blackboard. He lives New Jersey's most famous foreign-born citizen. So again, this is very staged. Instead, we often see him choking around. And this makes Albert Einstein so iconic and approachable by many. He apparently wrote four path-breaking science papers in 1904 while working secludedly far away from academic spotlight for the government in Switzerland in the patent office in Bern. This job was given to him through his father's friend, apparently because he did not get a proper academic science job. So one could say he was a failed scientist. Doing science away from scientific colleagues and without the help of students would seem very difficult. Unless, of course, you are the once in a century scientific genius. Let's look at Robert Oppenheimer, the protagonist of Christopher Nolan's movie, Father of the Atomic Bomb, and director of the Manhattan Project. He died in Princeton, New Jersey in 1967. So here are two short clips from interviews in the 1960s, which can be used as a baseline to see how he presumably normally behaves. Try to have an idea that may be helpful. And the part of physics that, that I, I try, try not to become too ignorant of any part, but the part that, that I I really get excited about is just what is called particle physics or atomic physics in its modern sense, but uh, why are things the way they are? What it is that's, that's conserved, maintained, kept invariant in, in these, these uh, fundamental particles, and, and uh, I've got a scheme here, and the point is that from this you can then get some notion of whether it really fits with the particles that are found. here charge is, is over this way. This is negative particles, neutral, doubly charged. Yeah. Uh, that is what people find isn't frightening. But the understanding of it sometimes has this quality. I remember a man who was my teacher in Göttingen, who's in Chicago now, James Frank. He said, the only way I can tell whether my thoughts are really have some weight is the sense of terror when I think of something new. Mm. We see him speaking slowly, thoughtfully. He's relatively animated. He has head movements, eye movements. He's smiling. There's changes in his mimics. Yeah, and we see him at the blackboard explaining something quite authentically. Here, another one. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, from all that you have said, it seems that when you contemplate the future, it is more with hope than with pessimism. Uh, well, I... Or is that an oversimplification? That's yes, hard I've to... tried to talk about the hopeful things. The unhopeful ones jump to everyone's mind. Uh, will the Chinese change their views of human destiny and of the relations between them and us before or after they have the power to make major nuclear war? It's anybody's guess. So we see him much more haggard looking, so worn out. But again, slow, thoughtful speech relatively animated. Here he looks down more. That can be a sign of shame and guilt. So all consistent with historic events, as they were told us. So here that's a famous NBC interview. Remember that we first responded to the question, what do scientists think? 
by saying that they think a variety of things and this is only natural. This is not a completely trivial question. We said second. So we just saw him swallowing. His eyes are teary and we don't see the interviewer really. So he's in a completely different mood here. He's much more stoic still. He looks more resignated. It's unclear what he looks at. His notes, the interviewer. We don't see it. We don't hear the interviewer. It's really like a long monologue. That we didn't think that we had before us the kind of information or the kind of insight or in back of us the kind of experience. Very low blinking rate. He's just looking at a particular point. As the important part comes later. So here we see then a close-up of this interview. And so the angle has completely changed. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. So we see him sniffing. Again, a low blinking rate, like he's focusing on something. Then he's looking away, like he wants to get away or he wants to avoid being seen emotional. He has his trembling lips, which could also be a facial tick because we saw it in the previous video as well, which was probably from a similar time. So the facial tick could come from an inner conflict, which is breaking out, which leads to uncontrolled behavior. It could be a sign of lack of coping with something or a side effect from medical treatment, let's say of some mental condition, like depression or something like that. So he has teary eyes and at some point he's uh, vibing off an imaginary tear, which could also be a pacifier to dissipate stress or to block the fewer intended to hide his face. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form. So he has these teary eyes, yeah? And this is a typical sign of sadness with the mouse corners go down and the crinkling of the chin. So he clearly feels sad even so he's very focused, very concentrated almost. And says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So he lifts his chin, which could be a sign of pride or to make a point for emphasis. And there's a bit of a hidden Mona Lisa smile, maybe seeing the irony in his position. But we don't really know the context of this interview. So he's surprisingly difficult to read because he's emotional, but at the same time concentrated, like he's absent-minded, but concentrated. So the interview looks highly staged, very poetic, with a Hindu scripture quote. On one hand, it's unusual for rational scientists, but it's maybe not so unusual for the 1960s. I think Feynman, his colleague, wasn't so different in that respect, but it's certainly very different from the previous interviews and it breaks with this baseline. Okay, to me, some of these old historic interviews, like the last one, seem to reflect more the type of acting used at that time. In the 1950s, the acting switched from exaggerated uh, theater-like acting, exaggerated as it was, it had to be understandable and visually uh, clear from a distance to a more natural way of acting, so-called method acting, pioneered by Marlon Brando, James Dean, and Marilyn Monroe. When you put yourself in a particular situation, in your mind, in your thoughts, to feel authentic, to feel the feelings the actor is supposed to feel. In his case, uh, Robert Oppenheimer's case, fitting to the time, it seems to contain a mixture of both theatrical uh, acting on the one hand, the close-up, the Hindu scripture, and so on, but also at the same time there's authenticity because he's actually teary and he has uh, features of a sad person around his mouth and yeah, generally he's looking down even so quite stoically. These are all signs of sadness and potentially guilt and that makes sense. 
And this short video clip is amazingly useful for nowadays, how you can tie an entire blockbuster movie around it. This is essentially the clip to support that there was something much bigger going on with Oppenheimer and the conflict. Without this video clip, this movie, which we can see now, would not make a lot of sense. This is a historic evidence of the person we see in the movie, based on this clip. Okay, so in summary, history is what kind of facts we are presented with in school, in the news or in Hollywood movies. In particular, historical movies released at the right time can reinforce narratives and either warn us, which is useful, if no one reacts and does nothing, it can create hopelessness and fear. When you look at the historical footage of the scientists who gave us a key series of the 20th century, special and general relativity, not mentioning even photoelectric effect and theory of diffusion in terms of Einstein, and also quantum mechanics, here Oppenheimer, they do not seem overly convincing and the footage is quite sparse, in particular in terms of Einstein. Either because filming wasn't such a big deal and the quality was limited, but also oddly theatrical and scripted. So Einstein literally was reading off a script. And in the last clip, Oppenheimer was um, also extremely still unusual compared to the baseline. Like he's focusing on something, potentially reading something off as well. Also, I'm not implying anything. To me, this raises some questions. Um, it might indicate that um, history, how it's presented to us, is much more scripted than we might imagine. So I hope you found this analysis useful. Thank you very much for watching. And do let me know in the comments uh, how you see the movie, if you watched it, considering the time it was released and the political climate we are in. So all the best. And I talk to you next time. Bye. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another.